Good afternoon to all of you. It's excellent to see you all here. I hope you, everybody was uh, stimulated by the distinguished guests speaking at the first session. Uh, my name is Andrew Goodland. I'm the lead agriculture specialist for the World Bank uh, based here in New Delhi. So I'll be the moderator for this session. Um, so before we get started, let me just make a few uh, overall comments and then we can, we can dive into the, 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 the content. I think what we heard from the first speakers was that uh, nutrition and malnutrition, undernutrition remains a serious issue in South Asia. Uh, I don't think that's disputed. I think what we've seen and what we didn't hear about so much was was the enormous progress which has been made in South Asia on malnutrition over the past um, 30, 40 years. And uh, August, the World Bank country director, uh, talked a little bit about the Green Revolution and the impact that had on increasing cal calorie availability to the populations of India, but, but similarly in other countries in, in, in South Asia. But what we have seen in the last 10, 15 years is more of a concern that those rapid improvements that we saw through the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s have slowed. In fact, even some cases, especially following COVID, may have reversed. So even though there's been success, we're now in a situation where uh, a, a lot of nutritional indicators have have stalled or, or, or plateaued. Uh, what we see when we dig a bit deeper and look at, look at diets in, in South Asia, that there still is a predominance of, of uh, cereal consumption. Um, and it's cereal consumption at the expense of uh, a protein, it's at the expense of uh, leafy vegetables, uh, of fruits, uh, but instead of consumption of those vital uh, nutrients and food groups increasing, what we do see is also a rise in consumption of, of ultra-processed uh, foods. And uh, several of the speakers already made reference to increasing rates of, of, of obesity uh, within the uh, South Asia region. region. So uh, the topic of, of this, uh, this panel is on uh, integrated policy approaches to enhance nutritional outcomes of food systems in South Asia. Um, and this is absolutely vital. I mean, I think when we, when we think about the current situation in South Asia, to some extent, it's an outcome of the policy framework which is, which is dominant uh, across our South Asian countries. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a, a resident in India now. I was previously a resident in Sri Lanka. Uh, and a long time ago in, in Pakistan. And all of those countries, uh, the, the overall policy goal over the last uh, 40 years has been to, to um, uh, address food security, to address food security by increasing the production and consumption of, of cereals primarily. Um, and that has been very successful in increasing, increasing availability of calories through through um, uh, cereals. Uh, however, the question before us, I think, is whether that existing policy framework is fit for, process, fit for purpose when we think about some of the emerging uh, nutritional objectives. Uh, is that help us going to get to um, uh, uh, more diversified diets, uh, more affordable diets, uh, is that going to help us to, to have more joined up uh, uh, policy responses to some of these challenges? So that's the, that's the, uh, uh, the question before the panelists today, and we're looking forward to, to a good uh, uh, discussion. Uh, what I'll do is firstly to um, uh, uh, let everybody uh, uh, speak from their, their own institutional perspectives on how they see the challenge and some of the areas where they think they can uh, we can think about policy responses. Uh, and then after that, uh, we'll have some follow-up questions and, and uh, hopefully if there's time, we'll have questions from the audience as well. So start thinking of, of good questions you can put to this esteemed panel. Um, 
so uh, uh, firstly, well, and firstly, actually, apologies that we're so uh, male-dominated on this panel. <laughs> we did have <laughs> we did have one uh, a, a woman uh, panelist who unfortunately is is unwell, so had to, had to drop out. So so. Uh, for, for speaking from my, uh, my gender, I just apologize for that. We're not trying to mansplain anything to you here. Um, so firstly, I'd like to turn to uh, uh, Dr. Ranjit Singh. Dr. Ranjit Singh is a, a joint secretary at the Ministry of, of Food Processing Industries here, here in India. And firstly, Dr. Singh, I'd like to add uh, to what we heard uh, before to congratulate you and Mofpi on putting on this fantastic event uh, this last few days, uh, really impressive how you've pulled together so many people to have such stimulating uh, a discussion. So uh, congratulations to that, for you to that. Um, so, you know, the, 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 um, uh, most of the food that we eat is, is processed in some way, uh, a primary process, <coughs> secondary process. Uh, I guess when we're having discussions with food processors, maybe nutrition is not the first thing we're thinking about, but clearly nutrition is, is an important outcome of, of, of processing. So it'd be good to hear your thoughts about the role of the food, process, pro, food process, processing industry, uh, the role of the, the, the government in India and MOFPI in helping to reorient uh, uh, food, food processing towards achieving nutritional, better nutritional outcomes. So, Dr. Singh, over to you. Thank you, Andrew. At the outset, uh, I'm thankful that to the World Bank and the Sapling so, for giving me this opportunity to be here among the very learned panel and uh, following up with the excellent panel of speakers who shared valuable experiences. And thanks for uh, being a part of this uh, World Food India that is our event, being a partner with us for that and uh, carrying the message forward. I will start by saying that, uh, see, uh, as you mentioned about the policies that we have, that we followed, we evolved. And uh, before, in the previous panel, there was a talk of uh, green evolution. So when we started after independence, our first goal was to meet the calorie needs of the growing population. So that's what our entire policy focus was, how we can improve our production and productivity and it was like how to feed the increasing population at that time also and thankfully um, with the great efforts supported by the government research came up and the varieties we got from mexico for wheat and other some other countries for rice the green evolution happened after that now there has been a shift in the policy as we heard in the previous panel that uh, at the same time we are experiencing undernutrition malnutrition various shades of that as well as the issues of obesity the coming from the ministry of food processing industries when i look at the entire value chain we need to follow a proper value chain and for me Either it starts at the R&D part. R&D research, basically, there is a, is a development of new varieties or breeds. It, is, it should be driven by the consumer demands. So what comes first, it's slightly debatable that the research has to meet the needs of the consumers. So then the, when we develop good varieties, there are clear cut defined breeding objectives, whether we want to produce for more quantity or more quality. Now, thankfully, the our R&D system, biggest uh, R&D system, that is the Indian Council of Agriculture Research and uh, State Agriculture Uni Universities, there is a great focus on breeding for higher qualities, biofortification of new varieties. We have come up with varieties in cereals with the uh, higher iron content, with higher micronutrient contents certain wheat varieties with higher protein content. So that is the initial part where we start. Then the, the growth practices, the growth medium, what is provided. So the varieties need the particular environment, the growth medium. If it is having higher protein content, naturally it will require more nitrogen to be applied, either through fertilizers or through the organic nodes. 
then next comes where my ministry comes to play its role that is the processing that we come somewhere in middle of the value chain so as a part of uh, ministry of food processing industries as the secretary herself mentioned we cater to the entire spectrum of uh, entrepreneurship starting from the micro level to all the way to the bigger industry level we have uh, three sets of very dedicated schemes when is first is the prime minister formalization of micro enterprises as uh, the joint additional secretary from rd also mentioned about that scheme we provide sports to the women self help groups where they can start very at the household level the primary processing activities the benefit there is then the objective is that first the food that is produced that is at the time of harvest it's a good quality so that there is no loss in quality as well as quantity once it is primarily handled and processed at the initial level so next stage comes the value addition and the secondary processing of that so that it reaches the consumer's plate in a palatable shape with good quality without any deterioration and without adulteration so that is the second stage where uh, we are uh, providing support to the enterprises of medium level by way of subsidies that is as ma'am mentioned it's it's a not a very big amount we provide 35% up to 35% of the capex that is one time but it's it's a kind of a nudge and many times what uh, my experience tells is what i have seen is that uh, many project products uh, many projects which when the entrepreneurs want to set up in areas which are not very well connected they are not easily bankable so our little bit sport makes those products financially uh, projects financially viable and uh, that's where uh, our role comes in it it serves many purposes i mean just hygienic packaging of the food produced uh, uh, scantry processing i mean uh, preserving its nutrient content so that there is no loss in till it reaches the plates we also support the critical infrastructure of cold chains so that there is no loss in quality there is a loss reduction in food waste and loss and if we can check the extent of food waste and loss automatically it it improves the availability of good food and nutritious food to the population at the consumers level we are also promoting new technologies uh, if uh, you can visit uh, my ministry's pavilion we are promoting the cold preservation technologies out of which food irradiation has been in existence for quite some time but somehow it has not taken up at a large scale in india especially for the domestic consumption so in recent budget the government of india announced that will support setting up of uh, 50 food irradiation units multi product food irradiation units it offers many advantages there is uh, no chance of any chemical contamination com coming in at that at that level and at the same time it increases the shelf life of many commodities as well as enhances the shelf uh, i mean hygienizes the food that is required so in these ways we we are encouraging the uh, processing proper packaging of all the uh, food so that it it is available then another aspect that uh, we we encourage is uh, we support the r&d into the food processing areas where we support pro pro projects by various institutions either government or private they come together with the private industries to bring up to develop technologies where uh, it can be reduction in use of art artificial colors artificial tasting agents or or any other uh, technique which which makes the food more hygiene uh, hyg uh, more hygienic and reduce the chemical footprint into the food value chain so th th these are few of the aspects where uh, we are focusing on where a lot of emphasis is going on then marketing branding of course it is there and apart from these what we see is that there is a need for uh, bigger campaigns campaigns for the consumer education as well okay we we out of taste because uh, our choices food choices are largely determined by the taste and when we have discussions with many people in the industry they say okay if i don't add so much of sugar my product will not sell so that is and then we know this i mean there are uh, 
adverse effects of excess sugars so it is the consumer choice as well which determines the industry which determines the what the industry puts in onto the market so that that aspect is also very important we we do work we do discuss it many times with our sister organizations from the consumer affairs that we need to generate awareness create awareness on these aspects so i think i will stop with this and then we can come back again thank you thanks so much uh, uh, dr ranjit i think it's really useful that you frame it that we need to look throughout the the value chains it doesn't stop at production it's through the processing but also at at the consumer end and the point that um which is faced globally that uh, uh, consumers don't always know what's good for them um and therefore the incentives for the food processing sector to produce uh, popular but unhealthy foods is is a very powerful one and we need to figure out how we can can break that um okay let me now turn the microphone to uh, uh, dr harry uh, bahadur um he's joint secretary at the ministry of agriculture and livestock department in the government of nepal uh, thanks so much for coming down to delhi uh we talked a little bit about the food processing no you all for more from the production side and of course um unless a, a farmer is produce a nutritious food there's no chance for consumers to have nutritious food uh, so it'd be very interesting to hear your insights on on the uh, in Nepal situation some of the challenges some of the things which maybe uh, you're thinking through uh, in terms of uh, approaching this challenge thank you sir uh, <coughs> thank you andrew uh, first of all i would like to extend uh, my thanks to uh, old bank sapling and uh, government of india for inviting us in this uh, very important uh, forum because we got opportunity to expose in a wide arena of uh, food processing uh, of india and it was really really impressive event that we are having uh, regarding uh, our situation in terms of food and nutrition security uh, i would say uh, we are in, in the recent years uh, the food security and nutrition security status is uh, being improved and we are from the ministry of agriculture and livestock development um, we, our main focus is again like uh, uh, ranjit sir uh, he said that we are also focusing on the production side uh, mostly uh, cereals is <laughs> again the priority for the food security and we are now uh, in in the recent years uh, we 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 are focusing on vegetables and fruits and even the livestock uh, and poultry so our uh, this uh, whole uh, food production system is uh, a bit now uh, improving and now the the production of this nutrient dense food like uh, livestock poultry and vegetable and fruits are uh, being uh increase and uh, uh regarding the this uh, food security and, uh, and and global hunger index if we check that uh, our situation is uh, now uh, very much improved and our uh, almost 20% uh, undernourishment uh, is reported there and also the child uh, nutrition indicators are uh, are improved this is a, a brief uh, scenario and uh, yes these are uh, being improved because of the access and the availability of both the nutrient uh, and, and the food items uh, to all uh, nepalese people because uh, in, in long before i will say 20 uh, 30 years before uh, because of the low income because of the poor connectivity uh, the transportation and other aspects Uh, the access and availability were uh, both uh, limited uh, in 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 uh, mostly in the for the poor community and the hill side of the country now it is it is uh, being improved so the the nutritional awareness is being improved the uh, access and uh, availability 
uh, both uh, has been improved and, and thus uh, we are getting a bit uh, good momentum. Uh, and uh, you see, Nepal has uh, considered the food uh, as a fundamental right of the people. It is uh, in, in the constitutional itself, we, we have uh, written that uh, food right is the fundamental right. So we have now uh, uh, working uh, with the Right to Food Act and uh, food sovereignty also. So uh, this is uh, being an issue uh, of the food, uh, food security and uh, not only the issue of food security but also the food right also. So this is uh, somewhat uh, we are working and we have recognized uh, nutrition uh, a multi-sectoral uh, issue because nutri if you talk about nutrition first it is the food food is mostly produced from agriculture sector from the farmers groups cooperatives and we are working from the ministry of agriculture and livestock development our institutions our all projects they are working with farmers and farmers groups and cooperatives uh, to produce food that is uh, the the most important part uh, and it is not uh, sufficient so there is health sector to make awareness uh, to the people and and uh, with their uh, personnel uh, in in the ground level they are giving uh, nutritional education uh, in 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 the local people to the local people uh, health sector is there we are there, even in education sector uh, is involved and, and, and like this the, the supplies is there uh, logistic supply all, all those uh, are connected in nutrition issues because it is not only the production it is the access it is the availability it is the education it is the consumer behavior the, the many of the things are connected so it has to be considered as the, the uh, multi-sectoral issue so we have this uh, multi-sectoral nutrition plan that we, we had, uh, uh, phase three is just started. We had two phases already completed, 10 years uh, con already completed uh, in the implementation of multi-sectoral nutrition plan. So uh, these are uh, giving a bit uh, good results uh, in, in the recent uh, years. And also we are, like um, uh, Ranjit Char has mentioned that, we have taken uh, now the food production itself is uh, a bit uh, more uh, transformative, transformative food sector that we have uh, been considering. The food system transformation is uh, everywhere we, we are talking about food system transformation. It is not only the production but also it has to respect the uh, consumer's behavior, consumer's preferences, it has to respect the environment and uh, uh, it has uh, to respect the disaster responses or everything. So food itself is a system and it has to work in the, we, ha we, ha we have to work on food system transformation also. And uh, in, in recent years, like uh, in India, because India is pioneering the millets, uh, millets production, millets um, processing, millets trade and everything. So we, we are also uh, following this, uh, the production and, and the consumption of millet based uh, food products. We are making uh, awareness to the to the consumers we are making some campaigns on the production and, and we are supporting farmers for production of millets and other uh, indigenous crops also and also uh, the organic uh, products uh, in mostly our hill agriculture is almost by default organic and we are promoting those uh, products to to uh, the urban uh, consumers so it is uh, we are doing uh, and uh, recently uh, we have tried, our research uh, organization uh, tried uh, to produce, to develop these biofortified varieties, uh, mostly the micronutrient rich cereals because if we are, we, we, we cannot leave rice, we, can, we have to, so uh, it, it has to be fortified with micronutrients, proteins or others if, if possible. So, uh, biofortified, uh, biofortification uh, uh, with uh, micronutrient has been already, uh, some varieties are coming up and uh, some like food fortification, is, uh, just we are starting food, for, food fortification uh, mainly in, in rice again. So, these are what uh, we are uh, working right now and we are supporting the government is, is schools uh, with, with the midday meal, midday meal support to, to uh, uh, to the students uh, studying in government schools and quite uh, uh, a big amount of money has been 
uh, investing in this type of uh, nutrition support uh, program. And the challenge is, you see, if I talk about the challenge, the most important is again the affordability of the nutrient-based food. If uh, we have to talk about the price of the cereals and, and price of the vegetables or livestock, there is always the price of cereals is low. And for the low-income people, uh, the poor, the marginalized people, uh, it is the only option that they have to go for. So uh, the, we have to uh, we have, we have uh, this type of challenge that to increase the uh, affordability uh, of the farmers of the rural poors uh, that we have to work with, and uh, again the cereal centric policy we are trying to change this. Again we have cereal centric policy like in India or in this whole region we are. Uh, First, we have to <laughs> we need a food secure situation, so, such type of things. And uh, another uh, is again the awareness. And the most important, you see, uh, if we are changing our diet towards fresh vegetables and fresh fruit, there is always the issue of this uh, pesticide and others in livestock and poultry, the um, hormones, antibiotics. And in fresh vegetables, albo, almo, uh, always the issue of uh, pesticide. So this issue, uh, we are trying our best to minimize the use of pesticides. Uh, we have a lot of integrated pest management programs uh, conducted uh, before, and now also it's uh, going on. But it's still, uh, the, the quite a issue is there in pesticide in fresh vegetables and fruits uh, to some extent and antibiotics and um, this antibiotics in, in livestock products. So this is, a, even we are talking nutrition, but if, if it is not safe, <laughs> it is always a problem. So we are also, we have to try, uh, we have to work on that also. And the very most important in this current time is uh, the use of ultra processed food, mainly by the young uh, consumers the youths, it is being a very uh, difficult problem to change their uh, feeding behavior towards uh, fresh products or uh, other uh, minimum uh, processed food, uh, primary processed food. So uh, this, this is having, uh, I, I had read a report from IFRI, I think it was launched uh, just one, two months before, and uh, we are in the region, we are the, our youths are the most uh, to, to consume this ultra processed food, in, particularly in the uh, urban areas. So this is uh, another challenge that we have to deal with, how to change their behavior towards uh, the uh, primary food and also how to make this ultra processed food uh, not that uh, bad for the health because <laughs> now we, we were also talking about that. And the last, I think, uh, I would say is um, uh, the issue of the climate change that we are facing, the disaster quite often, and the people are pushing towards the marginalized, people are uh, pushing towards very food unsecure situation, and that will push again to cereals or nutrient uh, less, other nutrient, uh, minimum nutrient food. Uh, not eating uh, vegetable fruits and uh, livestock, something like that. So these are some of the issues and challenges uh, that uh, we are facing, uh, not only in Nepal, I think uh, we all are in the region, we are facing this type of issues. So uh, this type of platform, maybe uh, we can discuss about this and how can we uh, have the good networking and platform uh, for, especially to address the issues of poor people, low income people, uh, to have their good nutrition food uh, in the future. Uh, so uh, the most, uh, I will uh, say at last, uh, the awareness is the most important, but still uh, nowadays we are thinking, we are, uh, we are talking about the food literacy. Because uh, and, and in food literacy, uh, women uh, farmers are uh, in the target because they are the one uh, to buy uh, the food, food items, to produce the food item, and uh, mostly they are uh, in the kitchen. So they should be aware uh, of what to eat, how to eat, how to prepare, and what not to eat, and, and those type of food literacy that we have to work together in the region so that uh, we can have uh, a, a bit good situation in food and uh, nutrition security.
Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Baharuda. That was uh, an excellent insight into what's happening in, in your country. Um, and a lot of very good things. And uh, I think the rest of the region can learn from some of these approaches. Food is a right, uh, that you have an integrated nutrition plan in the, in the country, uh, and many other of the, the positive examples you gave. OK, now I'd like to turn uh, to Mr. Pratap Singh Bertol. Uh, he is the director of the National Institute of Agriculture, Economics, and Policy Research at the Indian Council for Agriculture Research in the Government of, of India. Um, and Mr. Bertol, uh, we've heard a lot of the challenges around, around nutrition. It's a real, uh, from a policy perspective, it's, it's very, uh, a difficult, complex issue. Um, it would be great to hear your insights on, on, on policy, uh, which has an impact on, on nutrition, and specifically in, in India, and where you see there are opportunities and challenges of moving forward. Thank you. Please. Yeah, yes, it's okay. Uh, thank you, World Bank and uh, Andrew, for putting a very, you know, I can say it's a very simple as well as a very difficult questions related to policies. Because uh, policy makers are sitting on that side, policy analysts are on this side. <laughs> so it's really difficult to know, uh, to have a coherence. No, and between the different, you know, kind of policies and programs and all that kind of things. But uh, definitely you, in the beginning, you raised a very pertinent question regarding the cereal-centric food diets in South Asia. And that is where we should begin with. Because why it has happened, you, all of us are, we are very aware of this fact that uh, it is not only the India, but the entire South Asian uh, countries in the South Asia, they have been struggling to ensure sufficient food to its people during the 60s and the 70s. And then came the Green Revolution. India achieved a lot on that front, but at what cost? The, and the, one of the simplest reasons now what we feel that the agricultural policies that were framed to realize the gains from the Green Revolution, the high yielding seeds, so they have remained sticky till date. They didn't go any kind of reforms, be it the subsidies on fertilizer or be the minimum sport prices. We didn't try to reform those policies or align those policies with the, their negative externalities to the natural resources and the emerging economic opportunities in the domestic as well as the international markets. And the situation still continues. Now, of course, in, in India, the government is in a paradox. Farmers are asking for the legalization of the minimum sport prices. What will be its implications? There is a huge question before the government of India now. Now, if this kind of, you know, uh, pressures on the government uh, keep and the government accepts, so then it will be really a very challenge for the food system transformation or the sustainability of food system in the times to come. Uh, just you know, there are three or four major challenges, you know, but the entire South Asian region has been experiencing. And what I consider is that's the main challenge, generally we often ignore when we are talking about the food system transformation. The first challenge is the small and fragmenting land holdings. Yeah, throughout the, these countries, in all the countries, the holdings are too small to be provide an adequate livelihood of a farm, farm households. So that is one of the biggest challenges. So how to consolidate those kind of holdings? What kind of modes? Can we go for some kind of cooperative models or develop the But it is really difficult in the sense, still there is a very excessive employment pressure on agricultural sector. Rental unless we de-stress agriculture from the uh, employment pressure, it's really very difficult to go to that kind of options also. The third, what I think is that, of course, 
and these are of course the offshoots of the green revolutions. The quantitative and qualitative deterioration in the natural resources, be it the land or water. Now if you see in particularly the green revolution, this northern region in India, Punjab and Haryana, they fed the entire country, but at what cost? You see the groundwater has depleted like anything and this, this trend continues. And this has been spotted by the policies. If this trend continues, maybe in another 20, 25 years, this region may become a desert rather than a food supply. Anyway, on the nutritional outcomes, I think uh, there has been a lot of improvements in the nutritional outcomes. Uh, almost uh, throughout the South Asia over the past three decades, but what we observe is that in the recent decades or the recent years, uh, this kind of you know positive trends, either they have slowed down, or even plateaued or even reversed in some cases. I am citing some example from India. Now, see for example, incidence of anemia and obesity in India, it has increased like anything in the years to come. So, hence now what we are doing, we are feeling a triple burden of uh, undernutrition or malnutrition, micro deficiencies, obesity and uh, communicable diseases, the people are some. Now, <clears throat> again, when we are talking about the food system transformation and nutritional outcomes, for me there is a puzzle, particularly in the context of India. Now, still India ranks very high in uh, nutritional indicators. But despite the fact that there has been a significant increase in food supplies, be it cereals, be it the milk or fruits and vegetables, their per capita availability is also much more than the required norms. That means there is something wrong, either on the production, wrong in the data, either on the production side or on the demand side. So we have to reconcile. We have to develop mechanisms for capturing adequate data from on the both the sides. This is uh, the thing uh, that I would like to. Now ultimately, of course, that uh, these uh, solutions for this lie in the food system. And when we talk about the food system, it is from gene to gene uh, and consumption. When I say the gene means basically the research. So these uh, th things are there. I will not going to talk on that uh, food processing and all that. My colleague has already spoken that. But <clears throat> you know, in the uh, more this one session before that, you know, some success stories were highlighted about the food system transformation, whether it's for the secretary or the joint secretary. But the question is, how we are going to scale up these kind of you know success stories? And scale uping is a big issue. It is a big issue. I take a typical case of uh, you know our uh, dairy cooperatives, you know in India. They succeeded like anything, particularly in some states like Gujarat, but we could not replicate these elsewhere. So how we are going to replicate? What kind of institutions, what kind of policies, what kind of infrastructure it is required for, uh, for the government? So I will be developing on a few issues related to first, when we talk about the first, it is the commodities. Cereal-centric commodities to non-cereal type of commodities. And there lies a lot of scope in that to overcome some of these uh, challenges of the nutrition. Now, if you I talk generally, we forget about the two things. One is diversification towards high value crops, that is fruits, vegetables, and maybe some medicinal plants. And another is the diversification towards animal husbandry, poultry. We generally don't talk in the policy arenas and all that, but we generally remain, always remain serial centric our policies remain serial centric and let i may tell you in india these two groups they contribute nearly 60 percent to the agriculture gdp and even 75 they account for 75 percent of the growth these have been growing at a very faster rate than uh, other segments of that community they are cultivated by the poor small holders so they are more pro poor and as expected, they are pro-nutrition also. And more importantly, because since these generate a continuous flow of outputs, so in the times of you know, climatic shocks, etc., they act as a buffer. 
So this is uh, the power of this kind, but what we need there is, we have to have one strengthen the value chain for these commodities, right from uh, producers to the end consumption and require a lot of investment from Ministry of Food Processing Industries, cold storages and all those kind of things. Another thing when we are talking about uh, this is that we have to have think about the agricultural policies away from cereal centricity to nutrition sensitive crops like uh, this. So for that we have to repurpose our subsidies, incentive structures. So how we can do it, that is uh, a big issue because the cereal centric policy it has not only deteriorated, that caused damage to the natural resources and the environment, but over the in the times to come, you know, if you see the uh, uh, demands and food uh, demand and supply, food demand and supply reports from Niti uh, the, of the working group which I chaired. We projected the demand for different food commodities to 2047 when India is envisioned to be in the League of Developed Countries. At that time, the demand for you know, rice and wheat is unlikely to increase. It is the, basically the demand for fruits, vegetables and the animals uh, uh, products. The demand will be hugely uh, increasing because this kind of ins you know, incentive structure that we devised long back, it has become unsportive of the sustainable agri-food production systems now. So definitely we have to have think about uh, uh, this kind of uh, uh, things. And particularly I emphasize that there should be a crop neutral policy now because the objectives of food security we have achieved, a crop neutral policy should be there. Let the farmers uh, uh, do whatsoever they, they, they want to do. Likewise, you know, in the case of animal husbandry also, no, animal husbandry also, it is again a pro-poor activity. But it has not been given much importance in the policies. In India, the sector has remained underinvested as compared to its contribution. It has also not received much attention by the institutions, be it that uh, extension or the credit institutions. Another is here the more important and where we should focus it now because animal is an asset. It is a wealth for the farmers. And if there is an outbreak of disease, etc., everything destroys. So disease management, that's really important. And it is not only for the farmers, but from the perspective of the human health also, nutrition also. Now, if you see, uh, I think from World Bank in the morning, they were, they were, they were talking about one health program. Now, if you see that 70% of the infectious diseases in human beings, they are traced to the animals. They are traced to the animals and that COVID-19 is a, uh, uh, this one that. So, of course, the government of India has taken a, uh, has started a big program on control of foot and mouth disease and brucella, the two, two, two diseases, but you know, this requires you know, continuous efforts. A large scale prophylactic vaccine programs are required for that. Another thing when we're talking about this, you know, high value food commodities, be it the animal source foods or the horticulture based foods, we should have a targeting. Targeting in the sense we should target the women. Because women, they provide a lot of labor to, for these activities. They are custodian of the food security. And in one of my studies, what I observed is, in case of uh, livestock, where the lives, women have a power, uh, control over the livestock resources and the income they generate, they give preference or they, they allocate more of the income or expenditure to the education of the children and the health of the children. So targeting in this kind of activities, it is really uh, important. Another point that I would like to highlight is, <coughs> as I talked in the beginning, is the gene, that is the research. And in most of the South Asian countries, the investment in agriculture research is very poor. It doesn't exceed even 0.5% of their agriculture GDPs. And while the agriculture research, you know, it has the power to address the multiple challenges, be it the increasing food security or the resilience of agriculture or the quality of the output. So they have a lot of, you know, it has a lot of power to contribute the nutritional outcomes also. So the time has come that we should increase the funding for agriculture research and then reorient the agriculture research agenda from 
you know, from cereals to other kind of activity, a greater allocation of the uh, resources is required for that. And here, of course, the two candidates that uh, qualify for that one is adaptation and mitigation to climate change and then the biofortification. And uh, let I am happy to inform you that the Indian Council of Agriculture Research over the past 10, uh, 10 years or so had developed about 2,000 varieties of different crops resilient to different types of stresses. About 100 biofortified varieties of different crops. So the future, you know, lies in uh, uh, agriculture research. And what I, I always say that today's investment in R&D will save future trajectory of agricultural growth and its economic, social, and environmental outcomes. If you ignore agriculture resource, that means you are ignoring the food and nutrition security of the country. And your India's Green Revolution too, it will be based on these two pillars, that is climate resilience and this uh, biofortification. That is the need of the time. Again, a few more issues, particularly when you are talking about the food consumption and all that. So we have to be responsive consumers of food. That is really very important. So for that, of course, that uh, education to encourage healthy diet habits, and particularly when there was something or talked about the ultra processed foods. Now, let me tell you this consumption of ultra processed foods. It's in India, of course, I don't know about other South East, it is increasing like anything. The expenditure of this ultra processed food, including the food away from home, it has increased from about 5 7% in 2004 to 24% now. So this is again a very unhealthy trend. So we have to have, you know, some kind of, you know, education or awareness program among the people. And of course, uh, there is, uh, can we go for higher, very high level of taxation of these kind of things, or can we subsidize the healthy foods? This uh, policy decisions have to be uh, taken on that. But importantly, and uh, I think it's the final points of mine, India operates, you know, a big uh, public distribution system, basically based on rice and wheat. Why not we include pulses, millets, and other commodities also in uh, uh, the public distribution system. And then, of course, uh, it is the improving the synergy, as you have already indicated, on intersectoral synergy or the coordination among the because. Now, policies, food processing, Ministry is evolving its own policy framework. Agriculture Ministry is evolving its own framework. Ministry of Rural Development is, but there is a very little coordination among them. And if there is a lack of coordination, these policies may not yield the desired outcomes. So that for that we require, you know, we have to ensure a coordination and synergy between different uh, uh, kind of policies, be it related to agriculture, food processing, environment, or even the health. And these policies, you know, what is happening is that, of course, I am sitting in the ministry, so I propose, okay, we should do that. Let's involve the stakeholders. Who are our stakeholders? It should be a broad consultation-based kind of, you know, uh, policy problem there, so there is. Finally, uh, because uh, on food system transformation alone, you know, it is, it is, of course, a necessary but not a sufficient condition for better nutritional how it is you know, the environment that govern the food consumption or the food systems. I just, you know, it is basically, you can say, the safe drinking water, access to safe drinking water, which is essential for, you know, preparation of food and all that. Sanitation facilities, you know, they are always, and uh, uh, I don't know how many of you know, a recent uh, paper published in Nature on India's Swachh Bharat Mission. It has clearly indicated that it could avoid at least 70,000 infant from the death every year because of this kind of missions. So thank you very much. Um, so, so next, I'd like to uh, turn to uh, uh, Tam.
Takae uh, Igawara. He's the country director for FAO, uh, based here in, in India. Um, Taka, as you answered our sorry to do this to you, we're, we're running a little uh, short of time. So if you can just uh, 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 confine your comments to um, five minutes, that would be fan fantastic. And then we can, uh, we can, we can wrap up. Yes. I was, enjoy I was enjoying it so much, I wasn't going to stop you. Yeah. Andrew, I knew that, so I prepared the uh, stopwatch okay, in front of me. Okay. So I let me start. The, uh, okay. The, the Japanese approach to these. Right. <laughs> okay. So I try to be. Run on time yes. Try to be short. Over to you, Ten seconds already passed. Um, the key message uh, from me today is the um, in order to maintain the uh, food security, uh, we have to emphasize the nutrition security. And uh, what we want on the nutrition, a nutritional outcome is healthy life of everybody, the people. And for that matter, uh, we need agri-food system transformation that would lead to the economic growth. Without the economic growth, you can't reach the nutrition, sense of, uh, nutrition outcome. And the nutrition outcome also uh, drives the uh, nutri uh, economic growth. So uh, historically, uh, three, uh, through Green Revolution, India has focused on the food security. To me, as a sort of the risk management. However, for the, the future in India, agri-food system requires uh, sort of toward more the nutrition security. And uh, uh, there's some debate, but uh, in terms of numbers, but to me, India has largely achieved the food security. If you look at the uh, export of rice, the India is the second largest export of rice, uh, even in second last year. Uh, for example, uh, 21 million tons exported in uh, 2022, and 40% of the global rice trade. So, and uh, there was the, uh, a ban on the rice last year, non-basmati rice, but still 17.7 uh, .7 million tons of Basmati rice was exported. So if you look at the, uh, the amount of the, the rice and the amount of the food produced in India, there is, there is the, uh, you know, uh, a lot of the evidence that uh, India produces a lot of food. But still we have some sort of the uh, nutrition issues. There is some issues of the distribution, some sort of the processing, some sort of the other things. So um, I just want us to highlight that. And then um, FAO, uh, the strategic priority is the, uh, our mantra is agri-food system transformation. And the through four betters, better production, better nutrition, better environment, and better life. And uh, those four betters are closely linked to the economic growth. And then uh, we are really thinking that the nutrition security can serve as a cat catalyst for agri-food system transformation, which must be accompanied by the economic growth. So uh, we want to highlight economic growth is very important. The key, key uh, factors of the nutrition uh, outcomes. And um, as economic grows and the dis uh, disposable income increases, the people will start experiencing with variety of food. And uh, just give you an example, Japan, uh, during the 60s, um, more than the um, per capita rice consumption was about 120 kilograms annual per person. But now it went down to the 60 kilograms. The people eat different type of food, including the breads, of course, but the, a lot of the vegetable, fruit, and uh, seafood, and uh, some, you know, the meat products. So that in India, on the other hand, in the 60s, the per capita consumption was 60 kilograms. Now it's more than 100 kilograms per person. So you know, the um, when I look at the, my staff in the, my office, I started to feeling that the people have a little bit stomach, bigger stomach. <laughs> And when I see the, what they eat during the lunchtime, they eat rice with rice, with a little bit the uh, dal. 
So I said, you know, why don't you diversify your diet by bringing the more vegetables and all of that? But they said, oh, my stomach doesn't digest in the, uh, you know, the salad and uh, raw, uh, you know, leafy vegetables. So uh, some way, the, uh, um, I've learned that I've been here in India about one year. The uh, Indian people are a bit conservative in terms of the food consumption. And uh, I know that there are many of them vegetarian. So very, very careful what they eat. And, uh, but at the same time, I see that the many, many people start eating junk food, a lot of the uh, soft drinks, and uh, you know, a lots of sugar-based uh, food. So I think the, uh, that sort of the, the food culture has to be highlighted. This is where the, the policy uh, need uh, play a bigger role. And the last year, as you remember, uh, government of India promoted millet, and it was great success. And uh, you know, with the, uh, such policy can create sort of awareness, of awareness raising, and then people can start eating more millet. And that will continue. So that is the uh, sort of the, the policy issue that I would like to highlight. Um, another, do I have still? I st no, it's past the uh, six, five minutes. Uh, another, let me just highlight one more thing. Um, the government is now focusing on the, also the um, um, you know, white revolution, which is milk, that, that dairy product, and also the blue revolution focusing on the uh, aquaculture. And so the uh, government is uh, investing a lot in the different area of the, the food. And uh, let me see where, uh, what I want to say. Okay. Um, yes. You know, the uh, transmo uh, food, agri food system transformation require more uh, investment, both from consumers and then the government, not just by the, the farmers. And then the farmers are receiving very, very minimum amount of the, uh, you know, uh, money after producing the, uh, you know, the rice and then uh, also the lots of food. So um, I think that this is something uh, we need to uh, revisit and how we can uh, increase the yield, but at the same time the income what they receive, of course, and the government provide the support, minimum support price, but I think that we need to revisit the uh, sort of the, the prices. And then, unfortunately, consumer may have to pay more uh, for, the, the, uh, for, the, for the food that we, pro uh, we eat. And uh, finally, I just give you a couple of the, the figures. You know, that uh, India has 1.4 billion people, and then government, and then the, this country, provide the free grain for 800 million people. If you look at the entire Europe, including the western part of Russia and the western part of Turkey, total population is just 700 million. So 800 million, the government is providing the free food, the free you know, grains. It's a big, big achievement. And uh, we really need to emphasize that. And then uh, India, the size of the land is half of the Australia. And about 50% of the land is for the agriculture. And then about the half of the arable land or sowing land is under irrigation. But irrigation, majority of the irrigation coming from underground water. Okay. So the, uh, the future, as the, uh, the professor said, uh, we have the issue of the natural resource basis. So we need to uh, really address in the policy and the World Bank, FAO, and all other international agencies we address in the climate change and natural resource uh, management. So let me finish with that. Thank you, Thank you Taki. There's some very thought-provoking comparisons there. I'm amazed at what you said about the cons per capita consumption of rice in Japan today is the same as it was in India in, in the 1960s. And I think that uh, the fact that it's increased so much in, in, in India and across South Asia is due to these, um, how do you call it, serial-centric uh, 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 policies, and we need to move away from that. Um, okay, so let's move to our, our final uh, uh, panelist, um, uh, Mr. Siddharth uh, Chaturvedi. He's a senior Program Officer at the Gates Foundation here in India and um, 
and and also it's the Gates Foundation who is uh, supporting uh, Sapling. Uh, so we're very grateful to Gates. It's clearly nutrition and food systems are clearly a big priority for um, uh, Gates Foundation, and you recognise the importance of a regional platform, which is uh, fantastic. That's why we're here. Uh, so some some thoughts from you, Sidam. Uh, yeah, thanks, and I'll try to stick to five minutes or lesser. So, um, I think the challenges are well understood. Uh, the solutions are also there. What's important is uh, why we envisioned Sapling earlier and now obviously with the bank, is to say that while there are so many solutions and so many issues out there, who makes sense of it all? What's, what's the actionable? So. If I have to break it down, there are three kind of broad pieces that Sapling will be working on. The first part is sense making, that there are solutions, there are issues across the region, but then how do the country solutions add up to a region and how does a regional approach land in the country? So that's the first part of sense making and that would only come when we are targeting certain subsectors and certain policy makers or decision makers. So the first part of sense making through targeted solutions and targeted communication. The second piece is that once you communicate, what's the call to action? So we are very clear that we don't want to solve for everything. So if, if a policy brief or a recommendation coming from Sapling doesn't solve for what uh, Dr. Ranjit is trying to do or what Dr. Bahadur is trying to do in his country, it doesn't land anywhere. The beauty of Sapling currently is that it's advocacy, but it is led from a practitioner standpoint and not purely, it's a balance between research and practitioner, but it is largely led from a practitioner standpoint. And that's why the point of contacts in individual countries of the World Bank are so important. This action is not just a recommendation based action, but we hope that it will also lead to some sort of financing, both from the government and from the stakeholders towards the, these solutions. So as uh, Brithal sir also said, that th there are a lot of recommendations, but okay, what is important to me and when we talk of the subsectors, we are talking in terms of, you know, uh, as Brem said in, in, in the morning, that uh, we are talking about post harvest losses, climate smart agriculture, and food safety. But what does that really mean? Because climate smart agriculture or climate adaptation is, is supposed to be locally led. So we have to see how it lands. And that's where, again, the sense making happens. And all this effort has to be collaborative in nature. One of the things uh, our co-chair just said yesterday was that if he had a magic wand, he would first solve for malnutrition. That's how important it is for the Gates Foundation. And the way sapling is proceeding is a lot of, there's a lot of churning that's happening internally with the stakeholders in trying to understand what does the sector really need when we say the, a food system lens is required. Because it's it's a lot of things, it could be everything, but then what sapling's role? And that's, that's the churning that the bank team is doing currently, not internally, but also with the stakeholders. This is one of those forums. It's not a straight path. And what we feel is that it sapling has to solve towards a purpose along with the existing institutions like BIMSTEC, like SARC, and the other bilateral engagements that the country is already having. So as I said, it's not a straight path. So just to quote Douglas Adams, he said, I'm, I may not have gone where I wanted to, <coughs> wanted to go, but I've essentially ended where I needed to be. Thanks so much, um, uh, Siddharth. I think, uh, uh, and just uh, building on what you said and also what we heard from the Honorable Minister uh, of uh, Agriculture in Bhutan before, um, regional collaboration offers so much in this space, an opportunity to work together 
uh, to learn from one another and the sapling a platform which is in place offers the the opportunity to do this um, but it's not going to be straightforward and I hope that we have now champions in this room and on this panel who can help to take that forward um, so thank you to all the, the, the panelists unfortunately we're out of time I've been sent messages from the uh, the organizers so I'd promise the audience an opportunity for 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 questions but unfortunately we don't have time for that um, uh, just uh, just a couple of very uh, uh, final uh, uh, reflections I think what we heard today is the fundamental role of policy uh, to solve some of the nutritional challenges that we're facing. Uh, secondly, that the current serial-centric policy framework which exists across South Asia uh, may not be fit for purpose uh, for delivering on, 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 on nutrition. And the importance of, of thinking through integrated solutions uh, to be able to take to take this forward um, so again uh, 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 thanks to the the, the panelists um, before you go away we have a small gift uh, for uh, for each of you uh, I'd like to invite uh, Miss uh, Ramadevi she's the president of the Association of Lady Entrepreneurs of India to come and present thank you Okay, thank you all. Uh, let's uh, call the next uh, uh, panel onto stage, please. Sammy?